and welcome to my second Commodore 64 basic tutorial or example um, and who says you can't make a video game in basic well most sane people but it can be done um, if you don't mind it being quite simple um, you know it, everything's a trade-off with memory um, and time you know so things take up a lot more space in the computer's memory using basic because the, the code's got to sit in there as well as any graphic or sound effects, whatever, and the code is just a, takes up a lot more in terms of bytes, takes a lot more in terms of uh, processing power to then interpret that into machine code to execute, yada yada. You know, there's plenty of arguments against it, which is why most of the games for the 8 bits were made in assembly, you know. Um, but any, anyhow, here is a very simple video game. It's about 75, 80, you know, something like that, between 75 and 80 lines of code if you don't count some of the uh, lines that are just remark statements. I'm going to go through it rather quickly. And this one in particular is very specific to the Commodore 64 because as you'll see, there's plenty of poke statements. And what poke does is it inserts whatever comes after the comma into the memory location, um, that the, the state, you know, which is the first argument in the statement. So poke into memory location 53248, the value that's in X. Anyway, let's go through it line by line and I'll try and keep it brief and snappy. Any questions or comments, put them in, well, any questions, yeah, put them in the comments below and I'll come back and answer them. Okay, so the very first line, we are setting things up. So poking zero into 53280 and to 53281 will set the border and the background or paper. So the border and the, the paper color, the you know, the, the color of the screen that you type on, on the Commodore 64, sets them to black. Zero is the color for black, one for white and so on. I don't know them all off the top of my head. I have to look them up. But anyway, that gives you a nice black screen for maximum contrast, I thought. And for the type of game that we're going to be, that this is, which is a very simple kind of shooter, if you like, Space Invaders kind of esque, um, then yeah, the black was, that was my choice. Um, poking 1 into 646 sets the text color to white. Um, I don't know why they're, they're so far away, you know, in terms of the number. Uh, but it, that's what it is. So we set the border and background to black, the text color to white, the maximum contrast for anything, any text that we then display on the screen later on. Um, and then straight away after that, we go to subroutine starting at line 1000. So let's whiz down and have a look at that. Okay, and you can see here, whoop, sorry, 1000. You can see here, there are, this is the data, the data statements come from 1000 all the way down to 2000. Um, it didn't need to be, could have been 1200 really, but whatever. In case there was more sprites, there's room now left room it so from line 1000 we're reading in the data for four sprites so sprite 0 1 2 and 3 and in brackets afterwards I've put what they what they are so sprite 0 is the launcher sprite 1 is the rocket sprite 2 is the UFO and sprite 3 is the boom <laughs> so rather than try and do it any other way I just create a sprite that is an explosion sprite um, for when there's a collision they are single color sprites and the color was originally set to one so again for maximum contrast black background and border and white um, sprites as well as text however i left that out in one iteration of the code and whatever was in those memory locations uh, for the color for that for each particular sprite just worked i think the rocket comes out red the launcher is white the ufo is kind of a blue color yeah, you'll see anyway when we get to paint it. So we've gone to subroutine site on 1000, read in all the data for the sprites, come back up here, that's the end of that line, line 10. I've set up a couple of variables here, and uh, in case you've forgotten from the previous video, or didn't bother watching it, <laughs> the colon on a line separates commands. So there are individual, you can put individual commands, more than one command on a, on a single line. Um, it'll still get read into, translated into its own memory, memory address by the interpreter, but whatever, for readability, similar statements, I like to group on a, on the same line. So we've got three poke statements and a go sub, and then we've got two variables being initialized, um, x with the value of 170 and y of 225. Why x and y? Well, because they will be coordinates, as you've probably seen from the, uh, the remark afterwards. So rather than just have to refer to actual numbers each time, we put them in a variable, we can then manipulate that variable, can't we? So we can add or subtract from that variable rather than having to do the maths ourself and uh, or remember numbers, it just wouldn't work. And certainly not as well. And the next four lines, that data that, we, that we've input or that's been read in needs to actually be read into specific memory locations. So we use the read command in a for loop 
And what we're doing is here, starting at memory location 12, location 12,800 for the first sprite, and each sprite is 64 bytes long. So from zero to 63 is 64 bytes in total. Uh, we're gonna read that data, and we're gonna poke uh, into memory location n, first bit of data, um, from read to read, it takes data and puts it into variable a, and then we can loop through it, so poking the first into a memory location 12,800, poke the first bit of data, then we'll increment 12,801, poke the next bit of data, and so on. This happens rather quickly, even though it's basic, so reading these four sprites, you'll see when the game runs for the first time, there's a slight pause, and then um, we're into the action, but that really, once this is done with, the, the data's in memory, we can reference it, with a, you know, manipulate it with the poke statements afterwards. Okay, so moving on, we were going to set up the locations. Well, first of all, the sprite pointers. So we need to tell the computer where to, to point to for the um, for the sprites, for each sprite. So sprite pointers 0 and 1 are at 200. So we poke 200 into 2040. And then for sprite 1, 201 into 2041. And so on for 2 and 3. Very similar. Uh, these poke statements poke the X position. So that's 170. X hasn't been um, operated on since we set it into 53248. So that's the exposition for sprite zero. We're using the same one, the same exposition for sprite one, which is the rocket. Remember from when we looked down line 1000. So um, it's because we want the, the rocket when we fire it to launch out of the launcher. So we start them in the same X position. So that's left and right on the screen. <coughs> Excuse me. And then the, the next one, I set up two uh, two things here. So sprite um, the exposition for sprite two will have it zero. So I want it to start on the very leftmost section of the screen, which is actually behind the border. Okay, so it'll kind of appear off from the edge of the screen. Uh, so sprite two starting at zero. And I'm also going to set up a variable called UFO with the contents of memory location. That's what peak does. It, it looks it peaks at a memory location. So we've just literally stuffed zero into that memory location. And then we're getting it back out, putting it into to UFO. I could have just done UFO equals zero um, and manipulate it, but it's a, it seemed to me like um, a good use of the of the peak command, even though we do use it later. Um, but just so I could demonstrate it here and talk through it. Okay, a few more positions. So we've got the Y position, South of Sprite zero, one and two. So I've used Y on its own for Sprite zero. I've used Y minus 20. Now in my testing, because sprite one is the rocket, so when you launch it, if the Y position is exactly the same as the X position, it will appear on top of the other sprite, which would cause us a problem because it would, we're using collision detection, so that a collision would be registered, and also it just doesn't look right. You know, the, the rocket needs to launch out of the launcher. So in my testing, by subtracting 20 from it, it set the rocket to just above the launcher, which looked right before it started being you know, moved up the screen, as we'll see later. And then... For sprite two, which was at zero, one, two, the UFO, um, I've set the Y position at 50, so you don't want that being hidden by the border at the top of the screen, so 50 seemed, in my testing, a good position to start it from down the screen. Okay, and then this uh, memory, memory address deals with which sprites are currently being displayed or not. Okay, so it's an eight bit byte, obviously, and by putting five in there, it sets sprites at zero, the launcher, and two, the UFO, to uh, be in displayed. So it turns them on. Okay, so if you think about it, starting from the right, if we just had a one in here, that'd be bit one would be set to one, and that would just be sprite zero would be on. Okay, and if we had a three in there, so bits one and bits two, so one would have a one in it, two would have a one in it, add them together, the decimals together, the values, so that'd be three, so that'd be sprite zero and one. So we're not having that one on. So we've got the first bit on, second bit off, third bit, which would be four. So it goes one, two, four, you know, eight, 16, 32, 64, as you know. So um, by having a bit number three on, which is the value four, bit number one on value one, add them together, you get five. So that's how that works. Now, if I've rushed through that too quickly, and it's not quite clear to you, let me know in the comments, because I might make a video specifically on that, although there are plenty on YouTube if you just look around. And you may recall this from the previous statement here on line 136, the print CHR dollar sign 147. That prints a character to the screen or whatever character is referenced by this number 147. And as you can see from the remark statement, as demonstrated in the previous video, it just clears the screen of all text. It doesn't affect sprites. So any sprites that are being displayed 
will be displayed still, even though even though we're clearing the text of the screen or clearing printing the clear screen character. Okay, it just means that the when when you see it running, what I'm actually doing is literally copying and pasting this code into the emulator, into the Vice emulator, and you'll see it pasting in line by line. And then um, if we just run the code without that, then the sprites will be displayed over the top of the of the code we just put in. It'll be a right mess. We clear the screen. Okay, and here is the kind of main loop of the game, I guess. So we're setting up a variable k with the value of 203, memory location 203. Well, what's special about 203 or 203? Well, <laughs> yeah, the remark gives it away. This, see, this checks to see if a key has been pressed. Now, I believe there are two locations you can check, uh, 197v and the other one, and 203. I don't know if there's any difference. I, I didn't. I can't recall if I, if I tested with 197. But anyway, when no key is being depressed, um, on the Commodore 64, that memory location will have 64 in it. I believe it's 64 again from memory. But yeah, so it's not zero as you might expect. It'll be the, the you know the the value 64. So we're getting the value, sticking it into K, and then we're doing there's three of statements here to check the value of K, and we're checking for to see if it specifically is one of these three. So 10 would be uh, the value if A was being pressed. 18 if D was being pressed. And 60 if space was being pressed. And if either of them are true, then we go to subroutine starting at line 200, 300, or 500, respectively. Okay, so let's have a look and see what happens if, well, first of all, I should say, um, if nothing happens, if no, sorry, if no key has been pressed, then we will fall through here. None of these if statements will, will be true, so they'll all get skipped over. And then there's another if statement. So if the value in UFO, and you might remember we set it to value of that memory location which had just been set to zero, so this won't be true either at the moment, but if the value of the UFO is 255, then it resets to zero. Okay, well, why is that then? Um, we'll get to that in a moment. And then we're going to poke um, memory location 53253, which is the Y position for the UFO, for Sprite 2, I should say. And we're gonna poke that with the value that's already in that memory location, plus 20. Okay, so, um, it probably is a, an e a way to do this that's easier on the eye, but it's just another demonstration of how you can use peek and poke together. So we get the value that's in that memory location, adding 20 to it, and putting it back in there. So that's the Y coordinate, so that's the up and down axis on the screen. Um, so you might have worked out what this whole, whole thing's about. So um, if that doesn't get executed, because UFO isn't, the value of UFO isn't already 255, then we're gonna add, we're gonna move the UFO down by 20 pixels, okay? So what's happening is, UFO has got the X coordinate in it. When that reaches 255, it gets re reset to zero, and then we drop 20 pixels down on the screen. So if that wasn't clear from my rambling a moment ago, so that's, if, if um, if the UFO is less than 255, none of the rest of it get executed. Yeah, I know this is a separate command, but that's it for this line. This just doesn't happen. Okay, so let's, as would be on the first run through, UFO will be equal to zero, so none of that's gonna get executed. What happens here? Well, UFO is gonna get incremented by five. So if that, whether this happens or not, UFO is gonna get incremented by five. So either the value is already zero or some value less than 255, is going to get added to it. It's going to go up increments of five. Why not one? Well, because this is where basic, the limitations of having a video game in basic come into it. If it was only incremented by one each time, the UFO would be moving across the screen at a snail's pace. So by during my testing, um, having it increment by five meant that the UFO just moved across the screen at a more reasonable pace. You know, look, look better, more playable. Um, it does make it slightly jerky, I guess, but you probably won't notice it when the game's running. You'll you see that in a moment. Okay, so we're going to increment UFO by five, poke the value of UFO, the newly incremented value, back into the X position, so that's the effect of moving it across by five pixels. Okay, then we also check this memory location. What is this? This is a uh, the collision detection. Um, I want to say register, but it's not really. It's the uh, memory location. If there's a value greater than zero, then a collision has occurred. Now, the only way this would be greater than zero, is if the UFO has made it all the way down the screen and crashed into our launcher, and in which case you would lose. Hence why there's a print statement here with 
um, the string you lose after it. You may have noticed something new you might not have seen before. After print, we've got tab 30. So what that does is it moves um, moves the cursor across the screen 30 spaces before printing the message. So it'll have the effect of printing it in the kind of right-hand side of the page, and then it will go to subroutine site that's 600, which I won't do right now, but that's just the that's the kind of end game subroutine. We'll get to that when we get to that. Now, something I haven't explained here yet is what, what, what's special about the value 255? Is that the right hand edge of the screen? It's not. No, it isn't. So the, the screen is actually 320 pixels wide. But 320 does not fit in an 8 bit byte. The maximum is 255. Okay, if all the bits are set to 1. So, the Commodore does have a way of you being able to use the full width of the screen. You just have to set a value in another memory location, 2 or 1, and, um, and then you, you would reset, you still reset back to 0, but then you'd have the, the remaining, the remaining um, digits from 320. So 320 less 255 is uh, 65, I believe. No, yes. <laughs> so you've got 55, no, 55, 65, 75. Oh, crikey. And uh, so I did a lot of this from memory, unscripted, and I hope I haven't lost your interest just yet. So um, I'm not doing that here. Um, it was just a bit too much faff for, for the sake of this basic game. So what's going to happen is the UFO will hit an invisible wall on the right hand yeah, part way along the, or two thirds of the way, say, along uh, the screen to the right, and it'll just snap back to the, to the start. Okay, And that's why this area of the screen from, you know, 30 spaces over, this kind of right hand third will always be empty and it's in a good place to display messages. Okay, and if once it once the execution gets the line at 190, we're going to go back to 140. So this is our main loop. So unless we've branched away from this loop with a go sub, this loop will just keep repeating, which has the effect of the UFO moving from position 0 to position 255 in increments of 5 across the screen. When it hits that, it then resets back to zero, so back to the left-hand edge of the screen, and drops it by 20, by basically a pixels, uh, sorry, a sprite's height, 20 pixels down. Okay, so line 200. Well, 200 would be hit, you know, would be read and executed if the key um, A has been pressed during this loop when, when we're checking for it. And if so, um, that has the effect. A would move the launcher, you know, the the, the the player controlled sprite to the left. So why if X is above 30, only then would we decrement X by five? Well, 30 is, is about how wide the border is, 30 kind of pixels, and yeah, it's the width of the border basically, so I didn't want the launcher to disappear behind the, the border. Even though it's black and you can't see it, it's still there, and as long as we're not above 30, we can keep decrementing by five. If it is, then we don't, you know. If this um, turns out to be false, you know, so if x is equal to 30, then this won't happen. Okay, and then we're going to put the new position, the new value of x into the memory location 53248, which is the x coordinate for sprite 0. And then we return. So it's simple as that. So in that particular subroutine, so you get only what, three lines in total, it's just to deal with moving the, um, the player controlled sprite, the launcher left, until it reaches the border. Okay, if D was pressed, it would have the opposite effect. It would it would um, increment x by five as long as x was less than two fifty five. Okay, because uh, again we don't want it. Well, it wouldn't hit the border, but we don't want it going. We would not try to store a value higher than two fifty five into an eight bit byte and causing an error. Okay, so it will stop when it reaches two fifty five, and then we go back. Subroutine 500 is called if the space bar is pressed, and this one's a little length, lengthier, a little different. So what we do immediately is we turn on. So if you remember the um, this memory location deals with which sprites are being displayed at the you know, any time. A seven will have the effect of turning on sprites zero, one, and two. A typo there in the remark. Zero, one, and two. So now the launcher, the UFO, and the rocket are being displayed. And we also set the rocket's X position, although, yeah, we set the rocket's X position because obviously the launcher may have, may have moved. Um, 
So we just make sure that that's up to date as well so that the rocket appears in line with the launcher. Okay, and then we have a loop here. So we're setting M with the value of the memory location 53251, which is the Y coordinate. And we're gonna decrement that to zero. So by doing that, it would move up the screen, the rocket would move up the screen. We do that in steps of nine. That's minus nine because the value's getting, you know, starting high and going towards zero. Um, and that again, the reason for nine is just so the rocket moved at you know kind of reasonable speed that you might expect a, a projectile to move at. And then we're gonna poke the value of M into the Y coordinate for, for Sprite 2. Um, yeah, or whatever one the rocket is, I forget now. Okay, so during the loop, because the end of the loop is where the next M is, so down here. So we've done that, we put memory location in, uh, sorry, put the Y value in to the memory location and turn the sprite on. Now VC is a variable to check the contents of memory location 53278, which is the collision detection. So it'll always be zero unless there's a collision between two sprites. And in my testing, when the rocket collided with the UFO, the value went to six in this memory location. So I'm gonna set VC with the contents of that memory location. If it's a six, then we're gonna print over on the right hand side of the screen, you win. You win's a slightly shorter uh, string than you lose, hence why we've tapped over just a couple more spaces. So it's still in that area of the screen that's not being used by anything else. So we print you win, and then we'd go sub, go to subroutine sign at 600, which we'll be getting to shortly, which is just wraps up, you know, it's the end of the game. So it's very simple, either the UFO's gonna hit you after it makes its way down the screen, or you're gonna shoot a rocket into it, and that's when the game will end, win or lose. Okay, so assuming that VC doesn't have six in it, we are then going to um, we are then going to uh, poke zero into five three two seven eight for the collision detection memory location. Reading this out loud now, I don't know if we actually need to do that, but whatever, it's in there. <laughs> it's in there now. It should already be zero um, if there isn't a collision. But I think this. No, I don't know. I'm not going to ramble on about that now. Pontificate on why I've done that. We'll see if it works shortly when that when it's all run. Okay, then there's another if statement. If the U UFO value is 255, then we set it to zero and do the same thing as we did on line 180. Well, why are we doing that here? Well, if we didn't, then what happens is when you shoot the rocket, the UFO would freeze and just stay in one position on the screen. So we need to continue. We need to copy those, which I have done, copy those commands from the main loop into this loop as well. So although we've branched out of the main loop, we still need certain things to have execute to, to still execute. Okay, and then we're back to the um, you know the next go round in the in this for loop, this for m loop, and uh, the loop will end when you know whatever value was in five three two five one reaches zero. When that happens, the rocket will have left the screen. So we then go back to just displaying sprites um, <laughs> zero and. Zero and two, zero to four, zero to three, Ugh. zero, one, two, three, which are the four sprites. Okay, so we turn the rocket off, and then we're going to set the y value, the y variable, back to whatever uh, is in memory location 53249. So we reset the rocket starting position basically. So we set y to that, which should be the same as the launcher y position, and then we minus 20 off of it so that the rocket, when we turn it on, is just above the launcher. And then we're going to uh, set the X coordinate as well, so it's the same as the launcher, and then return, so back up to the main loop. Okay, so if we fired and we've missed, we'll end up back in the main loop here. If we fired and we hit, or if the UFO has hit us, then we will branch out to subroutine starting at 600. So what this does here is it switches off the collision detection, so it pokes zero back into that. Um, not register, but that memory location. And the reason we do that is if you want to play the game again, and that is already, and that yeah, that won't automatically get reset to zero. If we if we don't exit the game, we start again. You the game will instantly be over because it will detect a collision because this register is set to set to one or oh, well, greater than zero. Okay, so we do that. We turn off the collision detection, and then we um, also in that variable that we set up earlier to hold that value, we set that to zero as well just to be sure, and then we poke. We poke um, the X and Y locations for Sprite 3, which is the boom, 
into the same location that the rocket was, either the rocket or the UFO. You know, whatever, whatever, it, whatever these represent, I can't remember. That's the problem with dealing with, uh, with just, um, with just raw digits. You, you soon forget. I could look them up. They'll be in the code uh, up here when we set them all up, but it doesn't matter. So where were we? So here, yeah. So we're we're setting the uh, the the sprite for the boom. Um, and that will be, there's another for loop here which flashes that, that sprite. So, I don't know why I've used O, uh, but anyway, for O equals zero to 200, so it's gonna flash two, 200 times, and that happens rather quickly. Um, we can turn all sprites off, and then eight will turn, will have the effect of turning just the boom on, I believe. We'll see in a moment. Um, it'll either be the boom, or the launcher and the, uh, now, if all sprites are going off, we wouldn't be flashing the launcher as well, so this will just have the effect of having the boom flash on the screen. So the message, you win, will get displayed, and boom, or you lose, and the boom will flash. Okay, and then we just turn all sprites off, set the collision detection to, to nothing. Um, 53279 I haven't used before, and it probably doesn't need to be here, but there are two memory locations that deal with sprite collision. 53278, 53279, so just for completeness, I set them both to zero. And then there's another little uh, little loop here. For buff equals 631 to 640, poke zero into buff. So that's telling us that buff must be a memory location, so 631 to 640, what's that? Well, as <laughs> you probably already read from the remark, it clears the keyboard buffer. Now, if we've been pressing A and D to move our launcher left and right and space bar multiple times to fire multiple rockets, those key presses will be stored in the key in the keyboard buffer. There's a memory buffer, so if you're typing rather quickly, so that key strokes aren't missed, they get stored in the buffer before they're output to the screen or, or whatever the program running does with them. So by by poking zero into them, we're clearing the keyboard buffer, so that when we ask the question in the next line, press Y to play again or any other key to quit, um, we're not automatically going to press any other key. You know, an A or a D or a space isn't going to get passed through and we exit. Right, so we clear the buffer out, display the, the message, um, press Y to play again, and key to quit, and then it's just a basic um, A string with nothing in it. You can press the input. If there is none, then we repeat. So we get stuck in this line 633 loop. If Y is pressed, we go to 100. We start all over again from up here, setting the sprite pointers. We don't need to read anything into memory again. That will still be there, so that's why we go back up to... 100 set the, the, the x and y values um, if n we go to 636 um, which probably doesn't need to be there um, this probably did say press y to play again n to quit but being a basic input kind of um, uh, statement we're, we're waiting yeah we're reading the key press we're asking the user for a key press um, and staying in that loop, you know, just because we're looking for a Y or an N, that's well, not the user pressing something else. So I don't think 635 needs to be there, because if something else is pressed, we're automatically going to go through to 636 anyway, which will clear the screen again, turn all sprites off, and exit us out to the ready prompt in basic. So <laughs> if you're still with me after all this time, we're going to zip over now to the device emulator, paste all this code in, and see if it will run. So the device emulator here is set to run at the same speed as the actual C64, which is why it's quite slow. It's like if you list a big program in on a Commodore 64, if you list a big program, it will display at this kind of speed. Anyway, the first thing we're gonna see is those poke statements set in the border and the background to black. Then there's a pause while the sprite data is read in, and then the screen is cleared. So here we go, here's the game, and you can see the rocket launcher at the bottom, moving left and right with the A and D keys, space to fire the rockets. Just missed the UFO there, and there we go, we've scored a hit. And yeah, all the sprites are turned off except that boom strike, which plays, uh, which flashes over and over with the boom, and with the message you win on the right-hand side of the screen. You can see here that the UFO just kind of disappears at that, where it reaches that, the, the rightmost third of the screen, if you like. And uh, we're going to show, and this, this run through is going to show what happens if uh, if we miss and the UFO wins, if you like, and uh, crashes into the rocket launcher. Uh, we'll 
cooked there now. If you don't get it on this run through, you're cooked. I'm trying to outrun the UFO there, but run out of room and boom, you lose. Now you can just see there's a bit of artifacting here. Well, not artifacting, but look at that message on the screen. There's a few um, question marks in it and whatnot. And that's just, it's not that there's any error as such with the code. It's just something I've noticed that when you copy code over, and when you literally copy and paste it into the emulator, sometimes certain characters um, don't copy over quite as you'd hope they would, and certain things get input. But that only seems to happen, I've really noticed it mainly with print, but using a question mark instead of a print statement, um, and speech marks, they can cause a bit of an issue. But anyway, nothing to worry about. It works as expected. I hope you've enjoyed, and if you've stuck around this long, you deserve a medal for committing um, anyway, like and subscribe if you don't mind, and leave a comment or question below.